conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Welcome to today's episode of Think About It, where I speak to a colleague of mine and one of the experts on the idea of Marxism, Vivek Chibber, who is a professor of sociology at New York University, the author of several books and many articles, um, and the editor of a journal called Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy. Vivek's books are Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital and Locked in Place, State Building and Late Industrialization in India. The first book, Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital, has a direct reference to Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels' Manifesto of the Communist Party, now, now known mostly as the Communist Manifesto. The first line of that text is, a specter is haunting Europe, a ghost or a remnant. And then Marx and Engels lay out what defines communism, why communism is an inevitable force in world history. And here I just turned to Vivek to learn more. So I sat down with him to understand why Marxism is still relevant today and in what ways. Why it is being talked about in the sphere of politics, in this era where we are grappling with populism, with kind of returns to nationalism, and all sorts of questions that at some point in the mid-90s people thought had been laid to rest. So Vivek was gracious enough to sit down with me. We recorded this conversation actually in a studio, so if the sound is a bit echoey, please accept my apologies. And um, I look forward to hearing what you think about this conversation, about the role, the legacy, the significance of Karl Marx's thought today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for being on Think About It today. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I'm really happy to talk to you about uh, Karl Marx, <laughs> wh whose name is um, seems to be suddenly back in vogue, in both a good way and a bad way. And there's a lot of ideas about Marx. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, Ten years ago, this would have been unthinkable. But the, the culture, the political culture, has undergone a sea change just within a decade. So it's pretty impressive. And you mean everywhere, right? In, 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 including in the United States, where this was unthinkable because Marx was not. Especially in the United States, but yeah, everywhere. Uh, the, the, the left, as it were, the, uh, that was a dominant intellectual and political force across the 20th century, by the 1990s was in serious retreat all over the world. And by the early 2000s was basically small pockets of activists and intellectuals here and there. Uh, very isolated and treated with a great deal of derision or at best thought of as quaint, uh, antiquated uh, kind of relics from the past. You mean people who seriously read Marx or thought... Or who took Marx seriously. Who took yeah. Marx seriously. Yeah. yeah. And that's uh, changed dramatically and suddenly. In the, in I would say probably since 2008, 2009, since Occupy. That recently. Yeah. And in the 90s, is that linked to so the idea of the Fukuyama idea as the end of history, sort of liberal sort of neo-capitalism won out. And yeah, very much. Communism was defeated. Because I grew up in West Berlin, so I was living through this, and then it was defeated, and then we all knew what, what, what was going to come next, right? So there was a yeah. decade or so. Partly it was the idea that the, whatever experiment that had been, uh, the verdict was in, it was over, and there is no alternative. That's the Fukuyama uh, view. But, you know, uh, that's something that intellectuals pay a lot of attention to. Uh, the, the real bulwark and the source of support for the left had never been the intelligentsia. It had been ordinary people, their organizations, and their movements and their struggles. So to explain why those elements of the left uh, became uh, dormant or disappeared, it's not the Fukuyama intelligentsia side of it that's important. What's important is that the organizations of ordinary people, the left-wing parties, trade unions, socialist groups, they had all been dismantled or destroyed by the 90s. So what you had was this feeling that indeed nothing else is possible, not just because the Soviets were now gone, but also because people had no means of actually fighting effectively for anything. The political space was captured by elites and people kind of retreated into a very cynical and very demoralized state. That was true into the early 2000s. And this is, the trade unions probably in this country is mostly the effect sort of in the 80s sort of 
with Reagan, but leading up to Reagan also. Yep. Uh, dismantling the, of the union. Not just, yeah, the trade union, but also, you know, f- don't forget the civil rights movement was a well-organized movement based not just in the black church, but in community organizations and in the story is now being told finally in trade unions as well. So it's not just that labor had become disorganized, even social movements fighting for other kinds of rights and recognitions had also either been de- demobilized or in the case of women and blacks had been co-opted. There was a huge movement upward of a certain stratum of the black middle class and women in the middle class. And they had become linked to the dominant political parties and the dominant social forces. So for ordinary people down at the bottom, there wasn't really much happening for them. So what you were saying when, especially women African Americans were lifted up, but a lot of people were not lifted up. No, no, just a stratum. This a stratum of the middle class that they became a kind of a political broker class. Okay. But for the obviously for the vast majority of black Americans, things have been pretty awful for a very long time. They don't have a vehicle, though. They don't have any kind of organized expression for their problems. And that remains true today. And there's a distinction here when you're saying there's a lot of people who were left behind. They were economically left behind. And I think one of the things Marx gives us is a kind of difference between economic disadvantage or exploitation or difference versus political or moral disenfranchisement. So yeah. these people were in a position where they had neither political kind of the capacity to organize politically nor economically the resources to do that. Yeah. I mean, they're, as one very famous person said, their job in life was to shut up and shop. Okay. You go, you, shop, you do your work, you make a little money and you go out and shop and you watch TV. And what happened then from, let's say from, this is sort of through the 90s to, you say, 2008 roughly, what do you think happens to... and? to this kind of thoughts, to sort of these ideas. That it's destroyed, it's dead, right? Even right now in the US, there's an aspirational quality to the idea of socialism or left and all that, but there has never been a time in modern history where what's called the left didn't have a significant substantial place within communities of the working class, black, white, brown, whatever color. From the time that Marx wrote the manifesto onwards, the left was always uh, people located within working class communities, right. within trade unions, right. within the slums, within neighborhoods. Today, what's called the left is largely college educated people in campuses taking graduate seminars. And that's, there is no use. I mean, that, that is a historically useless force. <laughs> right, okay. But to go back to when you wrote the manifestos in 1848, he's also, he's a college educated young man, relatively young at this point, writing this. Yeah. And, but he's trying to appeal and talk with people and learn from people yeah. who are not college educated. Exactly. He's what you say, he's committed class suicide. He's somebody who's moved out of the elites. He spends his time on the run from the authorities. Right. He writes the manifesto in exile. Right after he writes it, Marx is kicked out of, um, uh, I think he wrote it in Belgium, and he's right. kicked out again. Um, so he goes from Germ- Germany, Trier, to Prussia, Belgium. That's right. Then France for a moment and London ultimately, ultimately, which is interesting, he settles as a refugee kind of in London, right? Yeah. Many people who couldn't live anywhere else anymore for That's political right. reasons. Right. But the, the main point is that it was a time when the intelligentsia that saw itself as having these views took it as its mission to connect with the people who they were writing about. Uh, that's not, that hasn't been true for a long time. Um, and what do you mean by class suicide? Can you explain that a little bit? Well, you're, you're born in a certain social position right. and you f- give up all the, the accoutrements and the privileges and the luxuries that come with that. And you immerse yourself. It's not an ascetic quality. It's not like Gandhiism, where it's all about personal sacrifice. It's as you realize that if you're going to organize and mobilize these people, you can't do it while vacationing once a week or you know on weekends, going down doing charity work and coming back out. You got to live there and you got to work with them. And not for a reason of being authentic, but for no, no. Understand it's just the only way to be effective. Stand. For reasons be of, of being effective. Okay. So he, he's he's with people who actually are in these conditions, and he's writing. Not on their behalf. So how do we understand the manifesto as kind of because... Well, you could say on their behalf, not at their behest necessarily, but on their behalf in that he's trying to get Marx and the manifesto is trying to give expression to a movement that's actually out there. You know, there's a very, there's a great passage in the manifesto where Marx says, we are not writing this simply as a way of predicting what the future is going to be in terms of the rise of a movement and all that. We are looking at what he calls the movement of history as it unfolds. Right. So they see themselves as parts of a social movement 
and giving an articulate expression to the demands of that movement, but not talking at the movement. They're simply trying to articulate what it's trying to do. Right. But that requires that you are familiar with the nitty gritty, the basic facts of what people are facing every day. Um, that is, has not been the case for a long time among the in progressive intelligentsia today. They vacation amongst the poor. <laughs> And if we stay with this text for a moment, so he's learning a lot from people who are in really different conditions. He's a journalist for a while. I think through Engels, he also has contact with workers. And he's actually really doing both the work of what we would call activism today, probably. Yeah. And what we would, I guess, call scholarship, although I think Marx would have considered himself a scholar in the way we... Well, he wouldn't call himself an academic, but he most certainly saw himself as a scholar. Yeah. And, and he saw there being no tension or contradiction between the scholarship and the organizing and activism, they were seen as being linked. To, and that's been, that was true of the left for 150 years. Um, all the most important, until the 1960s and 70s, the most important theoretical work that the left produced came, was written by people who weren't academics. Right. They weren't paid professionals. Right. They yeah. spent their time doing a lot of reading and writing, but they weren't housed in universities. And when this text comes out, if we go from there to today, which was a you know huge kind of leap, it's a long time. When it comes out, what is its original intention? Do you think what is Mar what is he trying to do? Is he's trying to speak on behalf of people who he said are already there. He's not trying to sort of conjure them into existence. The manifesto is a rallying cry. Mm -hmm. What it's meant to be a document that encapsulates and crystallizes the views of a working class movement as it's coming about, uh, but uh, also uh, is sort of bringing it together around a program, a political program. And at the end of the manifesto, you know, Marx has a 10-point program that he thinks this communist movement ought to be pushing for. Right. Um, so it's meant to do what, well, you know, what a manifesto does, which is declare mm -hmm. a certain goal, announce a strategy towards the pursuit of that goal, mm -hmm. and encapsulate that strategy in um, a political program. And it's a genre... It's a strange and kind of unusual thing. I mean, there were many, many manifestos written during that time in 1848. This is the only one we probably look at today, right? Yes. So why do you think it had this kind of force and power to carry itself through 170 years? Only because, you know, like the Bible. Uh, the, the Bible was an obscure document written by an obscure cult that was led by somebody who probably had, you know, some kind of disorder. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble for saying that. Uh, but but I do, it's, it's actually right. I mean, it's Marx, probably Socrates and Jesus or something who've had the most influence on the way the yeah. world is run, right? Yeah, now Socrates is curious in that respect because his ideas never took hold in a massive social movement. He, yeah. His afterlife has been exclusively in centers of learning. Okay. But what happens with Marx and the Bible is they both become state religions. And they, they both become, as, as it were, a, a kind of document that is, the same thing happens with the Quran, right? It's, they're carried forward uh, through social and military means into the world. Uh, with Marx, the Russian Revolution is the big event, right. which enables it to spread. But the one difference is the Re Russian Revolution is not something that th forces marks down the throats of the rest of the world. What it happens is it inspires a lot of other revolutions in the world who see that theory as being a theory which as it is a natural expression of, of what they're facing. Mm -hmm. But every time a gigantic movement s uses those works, those works now achieve a kind of salience and a life in the culture which they wouldn't have had before. So the short answer to your question is, why does the manifesto take off? It's because it in fact does express and articulate the sentiment of millions and hundreds of millions of people, both then and later, all the way into the, the 1960s and 70s. And can you give me a sense of what that sentiment is? What is the, let's say, the, I mean, there are many parts to it. There's a kind of historical overview of what happens, and then what is the sentiment that he captures, or that he and Engels captures? Well, he captures more a fact than a sentiment that's really important, which is that in modern society, the center of power, the place, the uh, concentration of power is in the hands of people who control all the wealth and that they derive their wealth by having authority over the activities and labor of others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, he wrote that at a time when that social fact was only true in a tiny part of the world, that's England, and some parts of Northern and Western Europe. 
Europe at the time that Marx wrote, writes a manifesto is still overwhelmingly an agrarian economy in which even within agriculture, wage labor and private property weren't really that widely spread. So at that time, he's actually projecting a future onto the world when he writes this. But by the 1920s, and certainly by the 1940s, the central fact that he's pointing to, which is that the holders of investable wealth are the people who both have economic power and political power, and thereby constitute the obstacle to any kind of redistribution of economic income and wealth. That fact is one that's true of virtually every country around the world. Now, in that era of the 1910s to the 1930s, 40s, is when you see the birth of the modern labor movement. Hmm. That labor movement has no choice but to confront the holders of wealth because labor is working for the holders of wealth. So they need some sort of analysis right. of what are the dynamics between us and these, our employers? What is the, uh, the constellation of power in the society? Why do our employers do what they do? Why do we always take it on the chin when we try to achieve some, something? For them, Marx was a natural expression of this. And it wasn't just labor. You know, Martin Luther King comes out of a black socialist tradition. He sees no contradiction between the pursuit of racial justice and the pursuit of class justice. The biggest march he ever organized, the March on Washington, was a march for jobs and justice. Okay. It was understood on the left that unless you have a strong commitment to economic redistribution, every other thing you're fighting for is gonna be very limited in its effects. And Marx's work was fundamentally a work analyzing, explaining, and giving a prescription for achieving economic justice. I mean, that's a really unusual thing in a small text of some 12,000 words to analyze. Well, as I said. And prescribe, but, it's, but I think it's important to sort of to break it up. It has this impact. It also analyzes history and it analyzes its present. Yeah. And it gets it right, as you say. A lot of it, the core of it, I mean, it got, it got a lot of stuff wrong, <laughs> um, but what it was, that's why he didn't stop with the manifesto. He goes on and does all this other right. stuff, and that's, right. that's, that's, that's intended, like, yeah. It's a little longer. That's intended to get the, the analytics right. Right. But the basic bare bone presentation of what the, the fault lines are in modern society, what the source of power is, and what sorts of demands might be uh, conducive to justice, that all the way down to John Rawls, everybody takes for granted. You know, Rawls in his last years finally came out and said, yeah, it, liberal justice is impossible in a capitalist society. And it's a fantastically you know, radical thing for him to say. Liberal justice impossible in a capitalist society, meaning capitalism cannot be modified to just fix a few things and redistribute a bit here and there because he says the fundamental issue is that political and economic power is concentrated in the hands of very few. Yeah. In Marx's analysis, how does this come about in the first place? Why do few um, people have all this? Robbery and theft is what he says, and okay. which is in fact true. Uh, the way in which it comes about, the essence of capitalism is a small group of people owns all the productive assets in society and everybody else has to go and work for them if they want access to money, to buy their own goods, to buy their own subsistence. So the question then becomes, how did these, this small group of people get a hold? of the productive assets of society, and it was by kicking peasants off the land. Okay. Some part of that, this happens first in England and in the, what's called the low countries, Holland and Denmark. Some part of that happens through just purchases. Landlords come in and buy land from their peasants and then consolidate it into large holdings. But what scholarship has shown is that most of it happens through fear, intimidation, by offering them money and that they don't want the money, you kick them off the land through force, and then many times by uh, not offering the money in the first place, just kicking them off. Okay. So it, as Marx famously said, private property emerges, you know, dripping with blood and dirt. So what you're saying is that the kind of conditions in the 1840s that he's analyzing are not natural or God given exactly. or fell from the sky. That's sort of you on this part and I may own very little or nothing. You say it has been brought about through an injustice in the first place. Yeah, in fact, it's a very recent mutation in human history. Until the 1600s, human history, the, the, the salient fact about property was that it was never privately owned, all the way into the late feudal era. You either had communal property, that's the most, uh, the longest lasting form of property in human history, right. or you had some sort of what you might call overlapping rights to land, where peasants 
would pay a rent to their landlord, but the landlord did not have exclusive rights to that land. So he would collect a rent, but as long as the peasant's willing to pay a rent, he can't be evicted. He couldn't kick them off. Exactly. It's only with, say, with the, uh, the enclosures in England of the rise of private property that you become a tenant at will, which means even if you're willing to pay the rent, even if you're willing to pay more rent, he can kick you off just because he, he doesn't like the way you look. <laughs> and this is a historical development. This is new. The enclosures, when does this happen in England? When do all these... The enclosures really get going. They, they start in the 13, 1400s, but they really get going from the late 1400s into the mid 1500s. And by 1600, about three fourths of the land in England now, they're called the enclosures because landlords put fences up around right. them. And that's an indication that this is my land. So by 1600, most of the land is exclusively owned by a small group and of so people. So what Marx is questioning at that point is, but a lot of people, though, accept as saying that's hundreds of years ago, that's just how the way everything is organized, right? Some people own it, they've owned it for generations, maybe their children are going to own it and I'm going to work there. That's right. It, it takes on the life, the appearance of something that's a part of nature. Yeah. Uh, so that's part of this, the, the, the most debilitating aspect of power is that it, you feel that it's so unmovable, it's so unshakable that it's like a fact of nature. Right. And the manifesto was partly an attempt to, for people to see that this, this social, the state of affairs is one that's not only a human creation, but very recent. And in fact, most of human history, this was considered to be an abomination, th this, this kind of state of affairs. And is the history considered correct, roughly? Because it, it, yeah. what I think is really powerful about the manifesto that it gives us this history to alert us to the fact that today's condition could be different. They could be otherwise. So there's, it's a ta he's telling a tale in the beginning, actually. I think the power of it is that it's so effective because it's a story. It's not an argument right. from the, in the beginning. In the second part, maybe more of an argument. Right. It's a morality tale that he says happens to be true, right? Uh, and is, is the history correct? That part of it certainly is. Mm -hmm. the, the, the part that these forms of property come about quite recently and that it's done through various illicit means, that there's no doubt about now. Right. Uh, other parts of the historical story, you know, one can um, sort of question, but he's relying, uh, remember he's writing in the 1840s when historical scholarship is just starting. So one can't fault him for having some of the, the facts wrong, but the basic contours are right. And to have this insight that power is um, concentrated in the hands of a few, both political and economic power, and that this may produce conditions. What are the conditions that are so problematic about this? Because before we get to all the criticism of Marx, you think this seems kind of a reasonable thing to say if very, very few people have both political and economic power over other people, that may not lead to good outcomes. Right. What is the big problem that he identifies here? There are two big problems. Uh, w one is um, economic, and the other you would call uh, political and moral. The economic one is that the inequality, once you have a fundamental inequality in asset ownership, so ownership of land, ownership of factories, banks, one small group of people owns that. Along with those property rights comes a right to the first claim on whatever income is being generated from those assets. So factory owner says, all right, you come work for me. Whatever money we make from this, I'm gonna decide what happens with that money because I own the stuff. So here's what I'm willing to offer you. Here's a wage I'm willing to offer you. You take it or leave it. Now, inevitably what that means is, as the owner, I'm gonna keep the bulk of it because I have the power to do so. That then creates what we call an income inequality, which means your livelihood, the extent, the money that you make is dependent on my whim, how much I'm willing to give you. So the initial inequality in asset ownership generates an inequality of income. Okay. So now, why does inequality of income matter? It's because you need money to buy stuff. <laughs> so if a whole bunch of people have very little money and you ask, why does this guy have all next to nothing? Well, one answer is because the person he's working for mm -hmm. runs a sweatshop and doesn't give him anything. Mm -hmm. So that means that as, if you're living in a society in which it's been set up so that the only way to get the basic goods that you need is by buying them on the market, and it turns out, that the money that it takes to buy the goods in the market is stuff, something you don't have, then addressing income inequality becomes the first task of social justice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That income inequality, however, if it's brought about by the asset inequality, means that that basic fact that he's talking about, this illicit means by which people usurp the means of production, is what's causing all the, so many of the other ills that we're seeing on the economic front. So that's, and that, that one fact is as true today as it is 
as it was in 1850. We'll, we'll get to that. I mean, just, you want to make a second point? Right? Yeah, the income yeah. inequality is the topic today yeah. around the world, which is quite interesting, and it's come back in a way. Yeah. And the reason Marx will never die, as long as there's capitalism, Jean-Paul Sartre famously said, as long as there's capitalism, Marxism is going to be around. He's the only, the only great social theorist of the modern era who says, if you, if you want the answer to the inequality question, go to the property question. Okay. You can't separate these two. And much of modern social science is an attempt to obscure this relationship because it's, it's just too explosive. So the second fact, which I think was very important then and is important now, is what I call the moral and the political one, which is that if you have all the money, you're also going to have all the political power. Now, this operates in two ways. At the macro level, we know, and American political science has finally, after 40 years of t being in a coma, come to realize that political power in the US is largely captured by the very wealthy. And the political science journals now are literate. So one is only waiting for sociology to wake up to this. And until now, for the last 40 years in their coma, they thought political power is distributed or it's- Pluralism. They, they thought, well, you know, in a modern society, anybody can form an interest group and right. the inter interest group process is what gives you politics. And that's, of course, empirically true. So anybody can. waking up? Is that, is that sort of, it's a symptom of that Citizens United or something like that to say that money influences politics? Where's, what, what has happened? I think the, what happened is that um, by the early 2000s, in some measure because of the birth of new movements around inequality, and the, before Occupy, there was a wave of movements against the WTO and globalization and all that, that did create something of a ferment. But I don't think that's what did it. I think what did it is, for academics, what works is, what influences them and motivates them is career ambitions. And what did it was that because of this ferment, a few books that came out with pointing to this met with such an incredibly positive response that it created an incentive both for foundations and for academics to say, let's probe further. Because now if we say that this is happening, we won't be branded commies and okay. you know, degenerates and renegades and it won't affect our career chances. So, but even political, to the political and moral kind of. Yeah, so at the macro level we know that Economic power translates into political power through the capture of the state and the state having to worry about uh, the economic conditions and keeping tax revenues coming in and keeping investment high. But there's also a micro level, which is that if I have no choice but to come and work for you as a way of paying my rent and getting food and all that stuff. Or as Mark it, said, as keeping yourself alive, you can work for me tomorrow again. Right. So the base basically says it's reduced to that. You just have to keep yourself well, it in is. enough shape and you can work tomorrow. Exactly. And for most of the 19th century, that's literally what it was. Uh, the the uh, average mortality rates within working class people were orders of magnitude greater than for in the people in the elites. And British, the British working class in the 1840s, the, the average lifespan was 30, 32 years. They would literally die on the, on the job, right? Well, when I come and work for you, it, because there, I'm not coming to work for you as a hobby or as an avocation, my life depends on it, it means it gives you enormous power over me. Right. So now you have effectively, so if I'm working 10 hours a day, which in Europe at that time was a short working day, most people work 12 to 14 hours. In America today, people now work 10 hour days again. For those 10 hours, I surrender my freedom to you. I stand where you tell me to, I pee when you tell me to, I eat when you tell me to. Right. And for the time that I go back home, I spend my time recovering so that I can come back and work for you again. Now, if a basic condition for social justice is A, having the means to be able to secure the fundamental means of livelihood, the, the, the subsistence needs, and B, the autonomy to decide what to do with my time and my body. Hmm. Both of those things are now, as far as I'm concerned as a worker, they are now in your control, not in mine. And to go back to this, so this kind of autonomy or freedom cannot be just fixed by saying, well, I'm going to give you some better conditions, you can wear whatever you want, or you can have flex hours, or you can, you know, and I'll, I don't tell you what to do when you're on your off time, or I'll give you longer breaks. Well, this. they can. I mean, if that were, in fact, the normal working condition where I we cobble together a, a labor contract, and you, the contract is, I report to you whenever I want, I work whenever I want. Well, no, that's great, <laughs> but it doesn't exist. Right. The, these jobs, insofar as they do exist, are only for a tiny fraction of the labor right. force. Flex time is a very good example. 
flex time gives you the uh, sense that a person comes in when he wants and leaves when he wants, works when he wants, but it, the hidden, the assumption behind the idea of flex time is whatever those arrangements are, you get enough hours and enough money to have a decent life. In fact, the reality of flex time is most people who are forced into that kind of work schedule, they don't get enough hours to be able to make a living for themselves. So what they're doing is holding down two or three jobs, all of which have flex time. Because flex time actually is not me as a worker having authority over when I work. It's you as an employer having the freedom to call me in whenever you want and send me packing whenever I want. So interestingly, one of the big demands of the labor movement in the 1920s was to do away with flex time. To do away with it. What we would probably call today the gig economy. So the gig economy, gig economy where people have two or three jobs yeah. and they actually work when there's demand because you log on to yeah. your Uber or exactly. mates or whatever it exactly. is. You can log on when there's demand, but when otherwise you just don't have an opportunity. Not just when, that's when, and that's where a small portion of the, the gig economy, for much of it, you log on when the employer signals to you. That was that, a good time to work. Yeah. yeah. So what that flexibility actually means is a loss of flexibility for the employee. So this autonomy and freedom, this is really critical um, for Marx. Absolutely. And it ends the Communist Manifesto. He says the proletarians of the world. They have nothing to lose but gain the world. They have, there's no freedom there, actually. There's, they don't have that kind of freedom. So why are these categories so important when you look at an economic analysis? Wouldn't economists say that's not our business, that's political science or philosophy or something like that? These categories of freedom and autonomy? Uh, well, it's true that they say that, but they're being disingenuous when they say it because they assume, they build into their models a degree of freedom and autonomy that uh, makes the models work. So for example, in the labor supply curve in marginalist economics, the when you, they ask why does a worker, how does a worker decide how many hours he wants to put it in the week, that worker is making a trade-off between leisure and work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the wage has to be at a certain level where it's worth it for him to go to work and below that level he'll say, well, I'd rather just stay home and watch TV. Right. So what are they assuming here? <laughs> They're assuming that this dude has the freedom to not work. Right, okay. <laughs> in other sense. words, yeah. either he's somebody with a really rich, <laughs> family yeah. so that it, it's like a college student deciding in the summer whether he wants to work or not, or it's somebody with a plot of land or some kind of assets which generates a stream of income. So they are building a degree of autonomy into their models and then saying, well, we don't say anything about autonomy. But this connection between sort of political power and economic power and what I guess you would call moral dimensions, freedom and autonomy, for Marx, these are inseparable. And to do an well, analysis without absolutely. one or the other, he says it makes no sense because you're also not talking about human beings. Exactly. You're not talking about... Exactly. Space, and it's not just Marx. All of 18th, 19th century economics took that for granted. Mm -hmm. It's only in the late 19th century when you see the birth of marginalism that there's an explicit abstraction away from these questions because the questions were too explosive. What we, what our department at NYU teaches as economics was really born in the 1880s. It was born in the 1880s largely as a response to the labor movement because the labor movement was using what's called, what then was called classical economics, which is Ricardo Smith and Marx, all of which was based on the idea that profits come from employers using the labor of employees. Right. And Adam Smith, the godfather of neoclassical economics, right. he was quite clear. He says, the workplace is a, is, a, is a despotic enterprise. It was just, he just says, there's no equality of power between employer and, and employee. What's invented in the 1880s as a response to this insight? Marginal. Seems, it comes from Adam Smith, you're saying, from, it's not a Marxist idea, it's sort of actually, it's, it precedes him. So what are the 1880s? 1880s is the birth of what we call marginalist economics, yeah. which says that classical economics is that profits is a component of the social surplus. Profit is what the employer takes for himself, and what's left over the, in the revenues, sorry, I said it wrong, it's not a prof, yeah, profit is part of the social surplus, and wages is something that the employer gives to the employee. After those wages are, are paid, is what, the surplus is what remains after they're paid, which means there's a direct zero-sum game between what the employer takes home and what the employee is getting. If you want to increase the surplus, increase the revenues of the firm, you drive wages down. That's one way to do it. So profits was a grab on the total revenue that the firm is making. Mm -hmm. What marginalism says is, well, profits and wages are simply a reflection of what each person brings to the enterprise. So there's nothing 
immoral going on here. There's no power whatsoever. The market settles profits and settles wages at a level where everybody gets exactly what the worth of their contribution is. That's done explicitly to deny that there's a power struggle between labor and capital. So what does the market do in there? It's an abstraction, it's supposed to... It means competitive really, arbitrage. And yeah. It's supposed to regulate itself in a way according to right. s according to a principle of what? Of each person... Sense? Uh, no, each person doing... Uh, the yeah. theory is internally coherent, it's very powerful, is that people go to work for other people, if they don't like what's being offered to them, they go and work for someone else, and it, it, through that there will be a kind of equilibration where nobody can take advantage of anyone and Does else. the market account for power? For Not in that model, that no. There's no other job available in your town, so you can't go no. and choose another job in the factory? No. So because if there's no job available in your town, you leave town and go somewhere else. But okay. at the end, prices and supply and quantity settle to what society needs and demands. So, so there's no conflict, there's no power. You mentioned a word earlier, a couple of minutes ago, about in the, around 2000, sort of these um, responses to the World Trade Organization and the responses to what we call globalization. That Marx predicts also that capitalism spreads, he said it sort of finds a place everywhere to settle and it, it pulls or yanks all these other societies and cultures and countries into the capitalist system and then will cover the whole globe. Yeah. What I find amazing that he writes in 1848 something that predicts 150 years of history. Yeah. And he gets it kind of right. He right? gets it exactly right. I mean, he gets it right <laughs> today. Today we have uh, communist countries, I guess China is a socialist country, right, supposedly mm -hmm. still, which is a kind of hugely capitalist enterprise. Yeah. So when he talks about that, let's say where we go today to 2000, we have globalization. Mm -hmm. So Marx is right. About that. Yeah. Capitalism spreads everywhere. Yeah. The conditions you've just identified don't even out things in the way the free market idea would have evened out things that, that everybody brings to the table what they can bring. I bring my labor, you bring your property and all this stuff and it works itself out. What we're realizing is more and more inequality comes out of this, right? Is that correct? That's exactly right. In fact, what happened, if you think of the neoliberal era as an era in which society moves closer and closer to the uh, the picture that free market economics paints as desirable. Let markets do their thing, take away all the regulations, take away all the state. If you think of neoliberalism as approximating the free market dream, the result is a, in fact a nightmare, which is that it's the era in which inequalities have exploded, in which wealth is ever more concentrated at the top, in which for the first time in 100 years in the United States, you're seeing lifespans shorten and it's not because of some random act. It's because people don't have the money to get health care and people don't have the money to get a decent uh, diet for themselves. So if anything, the era of globalization and neoliberalism should be seen as an absolute vindication of the fears, not only of Marx, but of people like Smith and Ricardo. And Why is it not kind of accepted then to say, let's even say the, the, the name Marx, which obviously is a trigger for a lot of people, will take that out. Adam Smith already explains it, and to say that this equality is recognized as a problem. Or is it recognized? And now it's being recognized. And it's, I'm yeah. kind of interested, it's both recognized, and we suddenly have discussions among politicians who use the word socialism and are not apologetic about it. Right. So AOC or Bernie Sanders or different people. Right. Other people still will say that this is Marxism that goes against everything human nature has ever wanted. Right. right. So there's still the kind of demonization of this idea that this is the right. wrong way to analyze. Well, the demonization is a constant. So that's, the demonization comes from where? It comes from the intelligentsia, it comes from media, and it comes from politicians. And these are all people, intellectuals gravitate to power, they orbit around power. That's such an obvious fact, it's, it's weird that it has all to be mentioned. All of them mentioned. always, really? <laughs> I guess well, Socrates I, is a good example. All, all of them is a, <laughs> yes. I don't know, as a generality. Um, intellectuals don't usually stand up to power because they're, they, they feed, they're fed by power. Interesting, yeah. And, the, and they are themselves is, part of the elite. Which is sort of a, a bit of a depressing realization because you would think the whole idea of an intellectual enterprise is to think. I mean, certainly, Things like tenure are meant to try to In academia, right? insulate them yeah. from it. Yeah. But you have to remember that intellectuals are themselves um, fairly well off in society. Right. And they don't experience what the vast majority of society experiences. So for them, it's kind of an abstraction to think about poverty. As I said, you so know. So you say this demonization happens among politicians, academics, intellectuals, etc. Yeah. But you're saying this is a key to understand where we are today. 
actually, and I think there's a big challenge to understand globalization. Sort of, so China is one big example to say it started out presumably with some Marxist precepts. It's probably not that today, I guess. Right, right, <laughs> right, yeah. And to say, why is this analysis not the only one that people are using right now to at least say something has to change? Because where are they going to get it? People don't divine an entire social framework in their head. Right. It's an enormously difficult collective undertaking to come up with a social theory a social and an analytical framework that explains things, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason Marx writes the manifesto is that he wants a popular, simple tract which can be taken into ordinary people's lives. Mm -hmm. But who's going to do the taking? Mm -hmm. It requires either it's going to be universities or political parties or organizations. Mm -hmm. Universities aren't going to do it because to the professors who teach in universities, this stuff makes no sense whatsoever. Do you think it should happen earlier in, prim in primary schools? It can't happen. It can never happen in schools. It will never happen in so schools. So schools are controlled by the government? Because the people, well, no. It's because the people who teach in schools belong to a so social stratum to which this is science fiction. Okay. Very few of them face these things. Very few of them experience it. And most of them orbit or move around in social circles to which, to, in which these ideas are anathema. So I have a two-part question. Why wouldn't people who benefit from the status quo right now think this is a problem because these people may rise up and challenge the status quo? Right. That's the one for you. Yes. By one? this, you mean the inequality. Yes. Yeah. Or the other one is out of solidarity or empathy to say people should not live under those conditions. So those right. are two different Yes, things. they are. So to answer the first question, they are in fact worrying that the inequality is getting out of hand and that is what's pushing one section of the political class and some wealthy entrepreneurs and bankers to say, you know, like Soros for example, say that this is getting out of control and if we don't do something to release the pressure now, it's gonna be something we can't handle down the line. But it's gonna, that's a very small percentage. And if history is any guide, that percentage is never large enough to make a dent in the actual political firmament. Now, the, your second part of your question was, what about people who think this is just a more? Those people exist, but again, it's a very small section of the intelligentsia. And most people, as you know, you're an academic, what do most academics want? They wanna do well, they want raises, they want outside offers, they want grants, they want promotions. You're not gonna get it if you go say capitalism is a problem and we need to redistribute. I mean, you'd have to be insane, right? So very few people actually in academia will ever actually say that because it's not a means for upward so they're not gonna mobility. Bite the hand. <laughs> it's not just, not by, as I keep coming back to this, Uli, they don't believe it themselves. Very few do. A small section that does come in. They don't believe in what part? The, believe that this is a real problem in society. They believe it's discrimination, inefficient markets, bad people, cronyism, corruption, but not the system itself. Better laws, Absolutely. Better itself. Exactly. Let exactly. me ask you something else about the fact that demonization. Wait, let me finish oh, sorry. because uh, sorry. I didn't properly answer your question yet. The On the solidarity yeah. part. Yeah. So within the elite, a small section will realize this, but let's say they do. Now, who's gonna take these ideas into the neighborhoods and into the workplace? <laughs> you need an organization, you need some kind of institutional links between the middle class or higher up and down below. The mass media won't let you do it. It's not gonna happen. So that's why the trade unions, the political organizations, all these things matter, and that's what doesn't exist today. So what happens is these left ideas become something, a, a form of banter mm -hmm. within the elite, like people like you and me, mm -hmm. which a tiny section of the population might have access to, but it's not gonna spread. Did Marx have some hope that, I mean, he wrote a manifesto and then he wrote Das Kapital much later, which was a bit harder to assimilate. He also thought newspapers, pamphlets, kind of activism, that people can be reached in other ways, right? I mean, yeah, it's, all the, it's the only media there was back then, so yeah. it was the only way to but reach But he did people. have some faith that the media could help in this way to disseminate some of this information? Or? Not what we would today call the corporate media. That's never been Not true. Not the real media. That, no, that's why they started their own newspapers yeah. and their own magazines, their own journals. I, I was gonna ask you something else about this. I mean, you've identified the kind of the resistance in people to actually spread this because they say it doesn't serve their own interest or maybe they also think it won't work. I also think um, people very quickly say Marxism equals Soviet Union, Soviet, right. Stalin, Mao right. Zedong, Pol Pot. So they have all the horror stories of Marxism gone wrong. Right. And I grew right. up in West Berlin right. next to East Germany. So believe me, I was taught two things, that Marx is right 
but it can't work. Right, right. <laughs> so this is the big difference between the 90s. We started with that in the conversation, right. and now these younger um, the millennials who are now flocking to the Sanders campaign, they are unmoved by the, the scaremongering. Now, calling it scaremongering is not entirely fair. It is, in fact, true that what was institutionalized in what was implemented in the Eastern Bloc and in China was not only truly awful, but one could say so far removed from Marx's own vision that it should have been given a different name. But it was real. And there was a reason to be suspicious of all those ideas. What Sanders has done today is that he has brought to people's attention the very true uh, fact, which also should be kept, kept in mind, that Marx's ideas did, in fact, truly give some rise to the Eastern Bloc and those f forms of government. But it, those same ideas is also what gave you Sweden and Norway and Denmark and modern social democracy. The political parties that fought for the civilization of capitalism, for its refinement and reforms, were all, they were all socialists and labor, uh, labor parties and had a lot of people inspired by Marx and Lenin. So we might say that the lineal descendants of Marx, had there was a fork in the road. One side went towards social democracy and the other side went towards communism. Now social democracy itself has also had its problems, but with regard to the particular liabilities of the communist system, the extinguishment of freedoms, the autocratic state, the, la the lack of freedom in the labor market, mm -hmm. those are things you cannot say about obviously the Nordic countries or even Germany, the West Germany. And the younger generation is inspired by that. So when they talk about socialism, the saying to Sanders, what they're really talking about is social democracy. But that's not dishonest, it's not dissembling because the, those models were also inspired by the same principles coming out of the socialist movement. Right. And these ideas of what's called social democracy, which really used to be kind of a slur in yeah. this country 10 years ago, and, yeah. was, you know, and all these campaign kind of Quibs, we're not Denmark or whatever they are. But what people want is access to health care, some better distribution of economic means. So this, is, this inequality isn't so vast that right. a few people have such concentration of wealth and political power and right. so few, so many people are disenfranchised. Right? Right, right. So they want things that are rather sensible. Right. But then there's a whole bunch of people talking against it saying this is incompatible with the way capitalism and democracy are linked as a kind of, and then they, they are come up with the idea of free market. So do you think there's a way in which this idea of social democracy could be a way forward to get the good ideas out of Marx into? Definitely. I mean, in terms of the American public, it's not only true now, it's been true for at least a generation that the American public in vast numbers and in super majorities supports most of what, say, someone like Sanders is pushing for. So for, to ha in terms of, first of all, the first precondition for a economic or political model being possible, which is that it has public support, that's very much true. The second condition has to be that it's realizable and feasible, but we have 70, 80 years of experience with these countries to know that it's feasible across every dimension, not just economic growth, but productivity growth, profit rates, technological dynamism, it's, all that stuff. It's also funny, it doesn't have to be Denmark, it could be Canada, even Australia. Has yeah. a Virtually any country that's not the US. Right, but it's <laughs> actually interesting that America believes there's no country in the world that works as well as America. You know, until the 2016 elections, yes. you would never know that the rest of the world has free healthcare. You would never know it because it was not allowed into the political debates. You would never know that most of the American public wants government-supported health care because it was never allowed. So the idea was Americans don't like big government. And anyway, this stuff can't work. And if you bring it in, it's going to be bureaucratic. It's going to be inefficient. And you literally did not, the, this vaunted intelligentsia of ours, this, the political class, the media, in all the presidential debates, it was never once mentioned by the moderator to the Clintons or to any of the Republican candidates, anybody. Hey, dude, do you know that in all of Western Europe, this stuff is free and it works? It was never mentioned. So that tells you the real obstacle is not American culture or the inefficiency of the systems or their, uh, their viability. It's the people who have power. And the talking heads who serve them. But what you're also identifying is that this idea was never mentioned. And to go back to why we're looking at this text, what I always found amazing that one person or two people, Marx and Engels, their idea could 
impact so many people's lives. I always ask my students, because I have a lot of students from all over the world, and I say, do you think people change the world or ideas change the world? And it's hard to answer. They say there's a couple of billion people, you know, living around the world. And yeah. you're, you've been asking this question throughout this conversation. How do you get the people who actually are most affected by this, who don't benefit from this at all, who are really just disadvantaged? How do you get them to, um, I guess my question is to have the tools to do this or to... Capacity. The word is capacity. capacity. How do you build the capacity? That, that's the million dollar question. And uh, nobody has that answer right now. Uh, we can only look back and see how it was done in the past. And the way it was done in the past was, first of all, people who were doing the organizing had to ditch the idea that the poor and the folks who are at the bottom of the system are either okay with it or that they don't realize that they're leading miserable lives. Mm -hmm. In the 90s and early 2000s, this idea started taking hold again that... Um, Neoliberalism is not only all pervasive, but it's captured people's imagination to the point where they really are buying into it. And what you're seeing in the last four or five years is that that was never true. What had happened was that people had become so demoralized and dejected that they had retreated into their homes and essentially just opted out. And the buying into it before then was the idea that everybody even very poor, disenfranchised people could ultimately attain yeah. this other status. Yeah. This great American, yeah. let's say, fantasy or yeah. hope, you could reach that yeah. upper class, middle class. So this is something intellectuals projected onto the population. Okay. In large measure, because I think a lot of them believe it themselves, but because they couldn't figure out why people are unhappy and angry, why don't they do something about it? So they said, well, maybe they're not unhappy, maybe they're not angry. The hard sociological truth is that when times get hard for working people, they don't rise up and rebel. What they mostly do is hunker down and just try to make it through. Mm. And that's what the 90s and early 2000s was about. And the reason they opt for that instead of rising up and rebelling is that it's a cute and romantic thing to think about. But what it means in its bare facts is that at your job, you now walk up to your employer or your manager and say, I'm sick and tired of getting these shitty wages, you need to give me a better deal. And the moment you say that, you're out on the street. So the, the, hard, the hard task is not to get the ideas to people. People already know they're leading horrible lives right. and that power is captured by the elites. Right. The hard task is getting them to undertake the risks that are involved in, act, in collective action. Because it's enormously risky because as I said, at the micro level, you're subject to power and to these vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. which is the most effective way of keeping control over people. And what in the past, the way people, the left did this was, when we started talking about the class suicide, organizers would literally immerse themselves in these workplaces, in these neighborhoods, and undertake those risks with the people who they were organizing. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, they lost. But there, were the, there have been these moments in which people were able to actually wield some sort of effective organizing tools. Right now, the biggest problem is there is no organizing in America, none, it's zero. The unions aren't organizing, middle class people aren't organizing, and workers aren't. I mean, it's not literally zero, but it, it, in terms of historical scale, it's right, zero. Okay. The only real activity out there is electoral activity right now, around the Sanders campaign and all that. And that's not nothing, but elections happen every four years. In between, you need something else to keep it going. And that, there's never been a time since he, Marx wrote the manifesto when we were at rock bottom in terms of actual community and workplace organizing. At the same time, as you're saying though, but there is genuine interest in these questions and it's yeah. urgent. It's urgent. And, it's, and, and I think what is happening, which is interesting that the kind of stigma is, is sort of waning, that the next generation is saying, you can tell me all day long that Marxism is evil. At least he's identified a few problems that we're still grappling with. Because you can't yeah. tell me that everything is so great. That's right. That's so right. I think the options are no longer Marxism is evil and we have the best system. They're saying, well, maybe there's a few questions we didn't answer. It, yeah, and system. this is the only people out there saying it the most really effectively right now is the far right. <laughs> the, the far right has realized that if you organize the poor, you've got a great game for yourself because you've already got the elites behind you. Now you've got the poor working for you too. 
but, and so the discourse that used to be the discourse of the left, which is you have the right to a job, you have the right to security, the rich have captured everything. Steve Bannon is the guy saying all that right now. The left is balkanized into 5,000 tiny little subcasts, each one of which hates the other and thinks that they're the only ones that matter. And that's an index of the fact that the left's been captured by professionals, by the middle class. Interesting. I have a hard time thinking that Steve Bannon is going to provide some hope here in a way, but at least he's maybe giving us the way to think about the issues. It's amazing how single-minded he is when you listen to him. (laughs) It's single-mindedly going to the poor and saying, you're being shafted by the rich. It's frightening when you see it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because it's a demagoguery that's very effective. This could be a final question. Do you think um, social media writ large can have any impact here at all? Because it could be viewed as either democratization of the media or it could be used as more power concentrated in the I mean, social media fundamentally is a gigantic marketing tool. That's what it's been used for. That's what it's being used for. And it could you know, turn into an Orwellian form of social control as well because the 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 degree to which they can follow each individual and what they're doing and where they're going. In terms of building movements, it had, it's had, a, I think, a du- dual effect, positive and negative. The, the positive, yeah, there are, it's, it's an effective way to announce events and reach out to people and all that, and it's helped. To organize, right. To organize, yeah. but it's also balkanized the population and especially what's called the left to a degree that I, I've never seen before. Much of the social media is just people shouting at each other. Right. Twitter, you know, has its word limits and you have these drive-by debates, you know, somebody screaming at somebody and walking off and as long as four people give you, share your view and give you a thumbs up or something, you're happy right. with it. Right. I, I'm of the view, actually, it's doing more harm than good. I'm trying my best. <laughs> yeah, right. I am. No, literally, I'm actually, I think about this a lot. I do think, I agree with you that polemics, I think, are really disastrous. Um, Foucault has this interesting line. He said, in a polemics, if you were given a magic wand, your idea would be to destroy the opponent, yeah. to eliminate him or her. Yeah. And he said, that is not what discussion or conversation is. Yeah. He said, actually, because in a discussion, you risk a lot because you risk your position to be challenged by the other person, but to move toward a shared consensus or a goal or toward some kind of truth or something like that. Yeah, and there's limits to how far that can go in society at large because there really is a conflict of interest. But what's, what one sees happening is that within constellations where you think there should be a common goal and a common interest, you, you see just such a f- in, incredible degeneration into yeah. ugly polemics and name calling and all that. It's designed uh, this way. I think it's designed mm. to generate a lot of adrenaline, quick bursts of excitement. So it's designed yeah. to be a polemic rather than a conversation. I, I think so. And so I, I think... But you do teach in, um, you teach um, not just in the university, but also for people who are not university students, right? Yeah. So t- the work you're trying to do is to teach in settings where people who are yeah. not in academia can learn how to organize? Is that the goal, one of the goals of this kind of teaching? Indeed it is. I mean, the, the idea is to make ideas simple and uh, to uh, translate them into terms that people who are themselves organizers can use and help develop their own ideas. Um, institutions like that, back when there were socialist and communist parties, they had their own schools. Right. School for workers, adult education, things like that. And when those organizations were destroyed and the universities captured all the intellectual space, that stuff went by the wayside. At a place like NYU, you can't even get a hall to have an event without being charged money. Everything is monetized, which means that the only people who have access are people who are already on the winning side of things. Right. So you- it, And intellectual labor is monetized. So actually you pay every speaker sometimes. Yeah. Also the great Marxist speakers are not always free. <laughs> so, uh, almost never free. So I actually appreciate it. You didn't charge me. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, there's no hope for getting things going again until left ideas cease to be the monopoly of professional academics and uh, intellectuals. Okay. Well, Vivek, I want to thank you for uh, this conversation. Yeah. Great. So this is, and in terms of reading, do you think the Communist Manifesto is the key text to start with for people who haven't read their Marx and are now maybe less yeah. phobic about it? It's, it's, a, it's a good place to start. Um, just not a good place to stop. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Thank you very much. I sure. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.